Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome to this video. Uh, we're gonna try something new here. And so I thought maybe it would be interesting to do a series on the Guild Ball Kickoff Mason set from the perspective of somebody that may have already tried the game. Maybe they attended a demo with their local pundit or somebody else that was teaching them the game uh, at using the uh, kickoff set. And now they have decided they really want to learn how to play uh, the Masons Guild. And specifically, they want to learn how to play the starting six that comes in the Guild Ball kickoff set. So the idea here is we're going to get uh, into some detail here with the Guild Ball kickoff set. And we're going to teach you how to play with the team as a whole and possibly some deep dive into specific players. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it and uh, we'll be back in just a second. So the first thing I want to cover is a couple of uh, disclaimers here. So this is a how to play the Guild Ball Mason set. We are not going to be talking about the Brewers they come in the kickoff set, as awesome a team as that is. Uh, this is really uh, my favorite team, uh, the Masons, so I play them as my main team. And frankly, my my team that I play competitively is not much different than this. So we are going to be covering specifically this team. Uh, there may be some afterthought about subs at the end of it, but primarily our focus is going to be how to get your head around playing the team out of the box because I do feel that this team is arguably one of the best starting six as far as pre-assembled sets in all of Guild Ball. Uh, this is an incredible team. It's capable of doing quite a bit. And I tell people this in all seriousness that you can, you could literally walk into a tournament with this six and play this six and actually stand a reasonably good chance of winning uh, or at least doing very well in the tournament. Now the Masons are a very well-rounded team and within this starting six you have a lot of things going on here. You have good ball control, you've got a good scoring game, you have a reasonably good bash game, uh, you have the ability to stretch the field, you have uh, some good localized reach in here, some good board control, and then you have some very specialized plays, uh, notably with your uh, with your Captain Honor and her ability to do two things in particular, sp superior strategy and then link to uh, O Harmony here. So it's a it's an extremely good team. You have one of the best strikers in the game here with Flint. You have the incredibly versatile uh, Mallet and then you have Brick and Marbles, who are just an awesome, awesome piece for board control. And then, like I said, you have, you know, maybe a couple of uh, one or maybe even two spectacular moments in the game possible with having O Harmony in this team. So it's a very strong team. Uh, and again, when we're talking just pre-assembled six, this is probably, I feel it's, it's, it's arguably the strongest pre-assembled six you can get in the game. Now it does have its weaknesses though. Because this is a team that is a balanced team and it's a synergy team, it has a few weaknesses. Uh, one of which is the fact that, hey, if this is a team that can do everything, this is also a team that is susceptible to everything. So it does a number of things very well, but if a, an opponent is able to play their style of game, they're more than likely going to be able to do it better than the Masons. So, for example, a fish team is going to be a better peer scoring team. Uh, they're going to have better control of the board. They're going to be able to stretch the field quite a bit against the Masons and, and try to draw the Masons out of their synergies. Uh, and then also on the other side of the play style there, you may have a butcher's team that is just so much better at damage. They can burn down the Masons. They can rack up that momentum. So they are also susceptible to a wide variety of play styles as well. They're also susceptible to character plays, especially ranged character plays. There aren't a lot of high defensive models in the Mason's Guild. Uh, you have good armor, so that, that helps a bit against 
uh, melee damage, but against ranged plays, snares, debuffs, uh, AoEs, all that kind of stuff, this team is going to be hindered a bit because of the fact that it relies so much on synergies and so much on distances between players. Okay, so now we're going to give a brief overview of each player that comes in the starting set. And uh, we're going to give a description that goes along with those. Um, but yeah, if this series is, proves to be popular, I would m be more than happy to go in-depth with each one of these players because they are very, very good. So starting with the Captain Honor here, she is uh, the First Lady of Guild Ball. Extremely versatile miniature, capable of very, very good damage. Excellent ball handling with a 4-6 kick. Reasonable defense at 3-2. And just extremely good stats uh, and also the tech to be able to cover the field and also her unique play st superior strategy which gives the, the masons uh, a very very powerful uh, the ability to reactivate within a turn then you have uh, the team's mascot who is marbles and marbles is also one of the best, if not the best, mascot in the game. Uh, Marbles has the ability to goad players out of position. He has also the ability to counter charge when he's within four inches of brick. And then he has a, a, a couple of really good passive abilities. Love Creature, which gives his team uh, plus tack if he gets uh, damaged. And also um, Assist Honor, which is absolutely brilliant. Then you have Mallet. He is kind of the everyman of the team. His, uh, he has a number of uh, potent abilities, uh, not the least of which is Football Legend. That's a 4-inch aura, which boosts the kick of nearby players. He is also somewhat unique in the game in that he has a 3-inch melee range on activation, and there are some very specific things that you can do there. Coupled with Forceful Blow and a very good playbook, uh, Mallet is one of the centerpieces of the team, at least how I run them. You then have uh, Flint, who is arguably one of the best strikers, if not the best striker in the game. It's what he does. He's great at getting the ball. He has close control. He has charmed male, so he has a little bit of added defense against uh, male characters, and just is a completely potent scoring threat. Harmony is probably the one character that if you are thinking about subbing, this may be where you start. You may start to sub Harmony out because she is a bit of a corner case, but she is sort of the X factor of the team, right? She is Honor's younger sister. She's capable of a linked activation, which would allow her to activate immediately after Honor. And that usually gives you an extremely powerful uh, moment in the game where you can do something to your opponent. Typically, it's going to be scoring uh, before the opponent can even react. And finally, you have Brick, one of the most influence-efficient models in the game due to his counter-charge ability, an excellent tank, but I wouldn't just rule out his ability to move pieces around the board. His control of the board is, is bar none, uh, one of the best in the entire game. So that's the six that we're looking at, and we're going to go over a few of the opening plays for this team. Okay, so now we're going to go over a standard set. Uh, and this is, again, this is just an example of a standard set. I'm using the, uh, the kickoff brewers there as the other example team. But here is an example of how I might set up my masons uh, at the start of the game. Uh, so, for example, I personally, I like to have uh, mallet. Towards the middle, I like to have mallet, uh, brick, and uh, marbles towards the middle. The reason being is I like to take advantage of mallet's 4-inch um, football legend, depending on how I'm going to be kicking the ball or how I'm going to be passing it out of the gate. Uh, and then for brick and marbles, I like them towards the middle because that's really where they're going to be taking advantage of their counter charge best. So in other words, the idea is to put uh, brick out here towards the middle of the field early in the game uh, and then set up marbles as well. That's going to set up your giant counter charge control bubble. And off to the side, but not too far out, I have uh, honor and... Um, 
Harmony. And the reason why I have them off to the side is, you know, in this play, Harmony is designed off the wing to be able to get the ball. And you want them reasonably clo close together because uh, you want to be able to use family and use her sister's um, kick stat to be able to pass the ball back. So in this case, Harmony is playing off to the wing in case the ball gets kicked out in that way. You all, there's also, uh, Harmony does get a defensive bonus from Brick if she's within four inches of Brick. So uh, the idea, it could be that uh, Brick can move towards the middle of the field and uh, wherever, Honor, uh, wherever Harmony ends up, she could end up being closer to Brick. Honor in the first turn, uh, she is going to be focusing in on her superior strategy play. That's really Honor's first turn, no matter what you're doing. If you're kicking or receiving, uh, you're going to want to decide with her, how am I going to use superior strategy? Because this is the best time in the game to employ it. You're typically only going to play it in that first turn of the game, but there may be some cases where you want to use it uh, in a later turn as well. And then finally, off to the side, I like to have Flint off on this far side here. Uh, again, the idea is you want the faster players out on the wing to be able to get, get the ball if they're receiving, or uh, if you are kicking, you may be able to kick something into a shallow, broad spot where uh, your character can get to it first. Uh, also, if you're re uh, receiving the ball, you know, it's kind of, it may be kind of a bad idea, for example, to to kick the ball towards the vicinity of Flint because especially if you have fast ground out there on the side, Flint can can easily get up to that ball. He could possibly uh, score on the first turn. But now that sort of begs the question is who do you kick with? And depending on who, you, who you're playing against and what your overall strategy is going to be, there are some basic uh, rules of thought that you might employ. Uh, so this, and this can kind of apply to most teams in general, but specifically with the Masons. Um, one idea, like I just mentioned, is you might be able to, to you might want to kick with your best kicker or the guy with the most threat range on goal because that immediately puts your opponent on the back foot. If you're able to kick a shallow kick with that type of player, uh, and it might be difficult for the opponent to get to, they're going to have to invest resources to get out there and get to that ball for fear of you getting to it first and then just kicking in a goal when they were the one receiving the ball. So that is a real threat. You might see that on a player like Flint, um, you know, even vitriol or even in some cases Friday, you might try something like that. The other school of thought is, hey, let's give it to the player that I want in the thick of things as early as possible. So you might give the ball to Brick. And this isn't a bad thought either for a couple of reasons. Because if you're in this set here and you're going to kick the ball, you would jog Brick up four here. And you'd kick the ball. You'd have the benefit of football legend, and he's already in good possession position to cover the field uh, for anybody receiving that ball. So that's just a couple of thoughts there regarding uh, who might kick the ball. Uh, but you know, obviously, it's not the most foolproof plan. But it's just to give you some ideas on what you might be able to do and what you're thinking uh, on that kickoff. Okay, so in this instance, I decided I'm going to risk and kick an extremely shallow kick there so you can see i just put the ball on the half way line there and again this uh, series is assuming everybody kind of knows the basics of guild ball here so we're going to go ahead and kick this ball and scatter it and see what happens here just as an example first we're going to determine accuracy of the kick so 4-8 kick and it's going to be accurate uh, so we can re-roll our scatter no Ooh. and i knocked down flint there uh, so let's go ahead and uh, scatter it. So blue is going to be direction and the green pundit dice will be uh, distance, right? So that's three, five. That's not a terrible kick. Uh, I can decide to re-roll it because I don't really like the five. And let's see what we get here. I mean, normally I would actually keep that kick. So uh, because I know I can get to it, but uh, let's see. Let's just try, right? So three, six. Okay, so even worse, <laughs> a little bit deeper, but that's fine. We'll go ahead and place that there. 
Okay, so now what we're gonna do, the final thing we're gonna do after we've scattered the ball is I'm just gonna give you guys a brief explanation of how I might allocate influence on the first team turn. So one of the downsides of this Masons team is we are only rocking 12 influence on this lineup. Uh, 12 is about average. It's not terrible, um, but it, you know, 13 would actually be fantastic for this squad. So normally what I would decide on the first turn is what, what are the main things for me to accomplish this first turn, especially in light of a really deep kick there. Now, I think the Brewers are going to try to kill this ball somehow. So they may, uh, they may try to run Friday out there if they can get out there. Um, and then they're going to try to bury it somewhere. So I have the option of trying to send Flint super deep to get that ball from Friday. Or uh, more likely, I can try to uh, boost someone to be able to uh, rack up a bunch of momentum for the following turn. So normally on the first turn, like I was saying, um, for honor, uh, superior strategy is going to be kind of a baseline play. So it's very normal for me to put four, or in this case, I'm going to put five on her. And then I would put three on somebody that I'm hoping to accomplish a lot with. I could do two or three. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to get a pretty good turn out of uh, Mallet, for example. So uh, let's put... Let's put two on Mallet. I don't think I need to do really anything with um, with Harmony this turn. Uh, and I don't know what I need to do with Brick. So uh, so we're gonna do, we're gonna, we're also gonna put at least two on Flint here. So that's nine and I still have three left. So again, Flint is probably going to get involved in the play or try to. Um, I might actually do. Uh, I might do one more each on. Uh, I might do one on. Let's do one on brick, and let's do one more on honor, and then actually, and then we'll do one more on mallet here. So my plan here is really. I don't think I'm going to be able to score this turn if I set up this way. Um, but I should be able to rack up some momentum off of getting Mallet into the play with superior strategy. Now, if I wanted superior strategy on Flint, for example, then I would just take that third influence and put that there on Flint, and we can play it out that way. All right, so that's going to do it for this part one of this video. Let me know what you guys think. If you want to see more from this series, maybe you want to learn how to play the Masons again. This is my favorite team. I love the Masons, so go Masons. So that's going to do for this video. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll catch you on the next one.